Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site. And this presentation's Electrical Power, Part 1, AC Electrics. So this presentation we're going to cover the AC electrical power system on all models of the 737, but with particular a focus on the NG and the MAX series with a dual battery configuration. As always, please treat your company training and their manuals as the authoritative source of information. Okay, so in this presentation we're going to cover the AC sources, AC system, load shedding, flight deck panels, and metering and diagnostics. Okay, well there's a, a photograph you hopefully don't encounter on the line. Um, this was a 737 in, in heavy maintenance uh, and I couldn't resist grabbing that photo. Um, according to Boeing there are approximately 46 miles of wire on the 737 Classic but only 42 miles on the 737NG and I think looking at that photo it starts to give you an idea of where that mileage comes from. Okay, this of course is another way of visualizing 40 miles of, of electrics. Um, it's the schematic, electrical schematic for a dual battery NG or MAX shown in the normal flight condition. Um, now, like all schematics, this looks really complicated uh, at first glance. Um, it, and like all schematics, they're not once you break them down into the component parts and, and start to understand them. It's actually a heck of a lot easier than it looks, you'd be pleased to hear. Uh, this schematic, whilst more detailed than the one in, in the FCOMs, it's still a quite a simplification of the of the actual layout. So, um, but this is the level we'll be we'll be pitching things at. You can divide the schematic into approximately three areas: the AC part, the DC, and the standby. For this presentation, I'm only going to cover the AC. Uh, DC and standby we'll, we'll do in the next video. Alright, so let's crack on. Sources of AC power. We, we've There are four sources. Two engine generators, an APU and ground power. That's it. They all connect onto the, onto the transfer buses through the respective breakers. So let's have a look at those components. Each engine has got an AC generator and I've highlighted that there in this photo. This is actually a generator off a Classic. It's it's very similar on the NG, albeit the, the, the drive is, is integrated with the with the generator. So there's your there's your generator. There's the constant speed drive unit. Uh, in, I say in this particular setup it's it's behind the generator. Uh, and that's the link between the, the generator and the engine, or at least the, the engine accessory gearbox. Now, the drive unit, or the, or the integrated drive, they have their own self-contained oil system for, for cooling and lubrication. And you can check this in the, in the sight glass be, before flight on, on the, the, your, your, your walk around inspection. There's a hatch on the side of, of each engine wh which you can, you can open and have a look in and just check the sight glass. The drive unit oil system is independent of the engine oil system. Okay, it's it's a it's a separate self-contained oil system with its own sight glass. On the on the power plant presentation, which I'll I'll do in the fullness of time, I will show you the sight glass for that one. So this is the sight glass for the uh, for the the generator oil levels. Uh, so you can you can check it on the on the pre-flight inspection. Now note that there are two different level marks there so I guess the first question is does this uh, generator need the oil topping up or not and the answer is 
in this with this photo you don't have enough information to answer that question what you need to know is are you looking at the left engine or the right engine and down at the bottom of the of the scales there it's actually labeled left and right the reason for the difference is that these uh, the, these side glasses, in fact, that the whole IDG is that they're interchangeable units. They can be fitted to either the, the the left or or the right engine, or the number one or the number two engine. But the Jenny is always on the port side of the engine. The uh, the engines are, are at different angles due to the dihedral of the wing, and that is why they show different levels depending which engine you're looking at. So if you're in the left engine, the oil level there is full. If you're in looking at this on the right engine then it's getting towards needing uh, needing a refill to correctly check the oil level you've got to vent the uh, the, the side glass for 15 seconds to, to release the pressure uh, so up at the top is is the vent button there and it says on push to vent you just push it to the to the right uh, it might emit a little spray of of oil, hot oil, if if the engine's just been run. If you're doing this on a turnaround, for instance, and it's still quite warm, then then just watch out for that, um, and then you can take an accurate reading. I, I guess that it, it's probably analogous to to wiping a dipstick on a on a car engine before you take the oil reading. It's it's the same, similar sort of thing. Now the Jennies are cooled by both fan air and a fuel oil heat exchanger. The the air cool uh, the air oil cooler is the one you see here in the in the photo. So this sits in the bypass airflow, and it's around uh, about the six thirty seven o'clock position as you as you look into the engine. After the oil has passed through that air oil cooler it then goes into a fuel oil heat exchanger which further cools the oil but also has the the beneficial effect of 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 heating the fuel a, a bit so it's a a, a little win-win situation there all right so for the jennies themselves this is a constant speed drive this was fitted to originals and classics um the the constant speed drive, it, it's driven through an inline variable ratio drive unit and this transmits the torque to the to the generator at constant speed from the, the variable speed accessory drive box on the on the engine. This allows the generator to produce AC at a constant frequency. Otherwise the, the, the frequency would be dependent on the RPM of the engine, so as as you change thrust then or, or M1s, so you, you would get a different uh, frequency, which is undesirable. So that's what the CSD does. Um, now, what we're looking at here in this photo is the constant speed drive, not the generator. The generator is actually forward of that. It's what we saw on the the opening picture, the the, the green unit, which is ahead of this. But that's the CSD, and that's the um, that's the oil glass in in situ on there. There's a reset handle at the bottom, that T-shaped handle there, and that's what engineers pull to physically reconnect the generator uh, to, the, to, the, to the accessory gearbox of the engine. Supply capacity of these, 45 kVA. The other kind of generators fitted to, uh, to classics were the VSCFs, the Variable Speed Constant Frequencies. Now these were driven from a variable speed shaft on the on the accessory gearbox. The Jenny then produced three phase AC at 115 volts, but between 1370 and 2545 hertz. So that was converted to 400 hertz within the VSCF by first converting it to DC and then back to AC. So quite a complicated system. Well, that's what gave you the, uh, the the correct frequency. This photo shows the old style VSCF, uh, which had the two LEDs, um, which uh, were, were for fault and open phase. 
you press the indicate button up there on the on the top left with the cockpit light set to bright to, to see if, if any of the LEDs indicate. If they do, you can cross check it with the Jenny diagnostic panel, which I'll come on to later and report it to the engineer. The button on the top right is, is just the LED lamp test. In 2001, Boeing and Hamilton Sunstrand, the, 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 the makers of, of these, introduced modifications to the VSCF to improve its reliability because the reliability when these were first introduced was about a third of that of the CSDs. Um, the failure rate was around about one every 2,000 hours. Um, and the failure rate was such that the, the UK CAA imposed a, a 45 minute limit, flying limit from a, the nearest suitable airfield if you had a, v, a VSCF installed. That limitation was removed when the, um, w when the mod was done on the VSCFs. And the new VSCFs, the modded ones, have got three LEDs rather than the two that you see in this photo. And there's an instruction plate for, for what the what the LEDs mean in, in red there, just below the light. On the NGs and the Max, uh, we took a leap forward and got the integrated drive Jennies, the, the IDGs, um, and the clue's in the name, it's integrated drive and generator. Uh, so it, it all the functions are there in, in, in that one unit. Uh, the sight glass, though, still because it's an interchangeable unit, can be can be fitted to either the the the, the number one or the number two engine. It's still got two levels, uh, depending which side you're reading it from. There are three coloured plugs up at the top right, and these are the the, the three phase cables. Uh, you got red, yellow, blue, and the the white one is the is the earth. This doesn't follow any standard um, colour coding that, that I know of back on terra firma. Um, if you were to show a regular electrician this, he he, he wouldn't know. I've, uh, I know I've Googled it for, for what is the standard colour coding of three phase. And uh, it appears it depends what part of the world you're in and indeed if you're airborne or not as to what is standard. But on an aircraft, uh, the A phase is red, B phase is yellow, and the C phase is blue. There you go. Um, big improvement in supply capacity with the IDGs were up to 90 kVA with these. So the, these are these are huge improvements on the on the other units. Now this is the um, the military. The, the, the P8, um, particular photos of a Poseidon, but it, it, it also holds true for the Wedgetails as well. The ID, because of the, the large amount of onboard electrical equipment on these aircraft, the the IDGs were were rated to 180 kVA, a huge increase in the uh, in in the power they can deliver. Uh, as a result, they're physically bigger. So the engine cowlings had to be redesigned with this bulge fairing that you can see here to house them. So there you go. That's a that's a little trivia point for you there. A word about IDG protections. Um, there are two. The 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 first is the the oil temperature. So the the IDGs will automatically physically disconnect from the drive if the oil temperature exceeds 182 centigrade. And that, as I say, the, the, there's a thermal disconnect switch on the unit um, there. So, so that happens to stop any, any further damage from, from happening. W once it's physically disconnected, the Jenny stops rotating and the, the oil temperature can start to cool down. Now the IDGs will automatically electrically disconnect by opening the, uh, the, the control relay and breaker for a frequency de deviation if the following limits are, are exceeded, either, either an over frequency limit or an under frequency limit. The limits are given there, you, you, you can read them. They are, are roughly full scale deflection on the, um, on the old gauges. Uh, with the digitals, we, we can we can read anything, and you can see there uh, an example on the right. 
So let's uh, let's recap those those different a uh, the, the the, the APU generators here. The, I say recap because this was all covered in the in the APU video that that I that I released a couple of weeks ago. The KVAs increased from the originals forty KVA right up to ninety KVA. The classics because of this lower rating. The with the APU you should only power one bus in the air. But if you accidentally take off with the APU on the buses, it'll continue to power both buses. For the NG and the MAX, the APU can supply both AC transfer buses either on the ground or in flight. So there, there are no restrictions there. And note there's no constant speed drive unit on the, the APU generator because the APU is a constant speed engine. All right, so generator control. Each generator, engine or APU, has got its own generator control unit in the e &E bay. These are only there for the for the NG and the Max. On the originals, they're on the P6 panel behind the FO. Now, for the NG and the Max. They not only control the power, but they've also got various lights to show you the um, the, the, the the faults that, that that can be displayed here, similar to those mounted on the on the VSC F generator, only more capable and more functionality. And I'll come onto these lights in the um, in the fault and diagnosis section. Ground power. Um, there's a blue ground power available light. Um, on all versions of the 737, but it's a slightly different uh, meaning and functionality on the, the originals and classics. So on the originals and classics, all it means is that the, the GPU is physically plugged into the aircraft. It gives you no indication about the quality of power. So just because the blue ground power available light is illuminated doesn't mean to say that you can it'll take on the buses. The NG, however, the quality is checked and the light will only illuminate it when the external power is connected and the quality is good enough to, to engage on the buses. The ground power receptacle looks like that and there are two lights of, of interest on this. The, the first one I've highlighted there is the amber external power connected indicator. Now this comes on when the ground power plug is connected and the ground source is operating. The light is not an indication that the power quality is in limits or that the ground power is in use. The white light is a not in use indicator and that comes on when um, when external power is available. The external power contact is open and both ground service transfer relays are de-energized. So that tells the ground crew that the, the, the ground power is, is not in use. That's, that's the one they should look at before disconnecting if they don't uh, get your attention first. The ground power plug itself and, and the receptacle, the, there are six six pins and, um, and six sockets on the plug. There are three pins for each AC power phase, your, your, your A, B and C phase, another pin for neutral, and then two extra pins. And these, these are shorter and narrower, and these are for the interlock logic. And what they do is, uh, well, they, well, they do two jobs if, if you like. The, the, the first is that these are the first pins to be disconnected when the when the plug is pulled out because they're physically shorter so those two will disconnect first. That then sends a, a message to the, 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 the bus power control unit to stop to cut off the electricity to, to stop the, um, the demand if, of the ground power electric and that prevents arcing when the plug is pulled out. 
So that's the first use for the two shore plugs. The second is that it's it's a a way of keying the the um, the the plug, so that the the ground crew can't put the the, the plug in the wrong way around, and that helps keep the 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 phases of in in order. All right, so back to the schematic. Um, for AC, we're going to look at the top half of this only in this presentation. First thing to note, there are three golden rules of, of 737 AC electrics. The first is that there is no paralleling of AC power. So what does that mean? It means you can't put more than one generator on a transfer bus or on a gem bus on the classics. So only one generator per bus. That's the first golden rule. The second golden rule means that is that the source of AC power being connected to the transfer bus takes priority and automatically disconnects the existing source. So if you've got, say, um, a gen drive on a transfer bus and you try and put the APU gen on that same bus, it will disconnect the gen drive for you to, to put the generator bus on. So it disconnects the existing source and the new source that you're trying to put on, it takes priority. The third golden rule is that an AC power source does not enter the system automatically. Now, this rule has actually been um, relaxed slightly on the NG and the Max with the automatic generator online feature. So let me explain that now. On the classics, if you were to accidentally take off with the APU on both bu bus buses, then it will continue to power both buses. But if you were to then switch the APU off or it were to fail, you would lose AC power. The aircraft would lose AC power until you manually put an engine journey back online. For the NG and the MAX, it's, it's smart, it looks after you. So the same scenario, you get airborne and you've inadvertently got airborne with the APU powering both buses. If the APU were to be shut down or were to fail, the engine generators will be automatically connected to, to the respective transfer buses. And this action can only occur once in flight. So that's the automatic generator online feature, which kind of rules out the, the, the third golden rule, which is that a source has to be connected manually. In this one particular instance, it doesn't. All right, so let's look at the, um, at the buses. So the first ones from the, from the power source are the, the AC transfer buses. And there are two of these, transfer bus one and two. These, I say, they're the point of connection for the power sources. Now, in the FCOMs, it only tells you that there is AC transfer bus 1 and AC transfer bu bus 2. But I'm here to tell you that, in actual fact, it's further subdivided into four transfer buses. And some of these are 115 volts, and some of these are, are 28 volts. The 28 volts, obviously, fed via a transformer. The 115 volt buses are used for heavy essential loads. And by that we mean, for instance, the electric hydraulic pumps. The 28 volts are used for lower voltage services such as lights. So that's your transfer buses there. The main buses are fed from the, the respective transfer buses, and these are used for non-essential loads. Things like the recirc fans, the door area heaters, drain mast heaters, logo lights, etc. So anything which could be shed is, is, is on the main buses. They're also 115 volts. Galley buses, also fed from the transfer buses, used, as you'd expect, for the ovens and the bed makers. Now the galley switch, 
or on, on later NGs and Maxes, the cabin util switch. It's kind of something of a misnomer because these switches, whichever one you've got fitted on your aircraft, they all will switch off both the galley and the main buses. So the, my the takeaway learning point here, here is that although they're labelled either cabin, cali or uh, cab util, they will switch off more than the galley. They will switch off the main buses as well. But as I've already said, the main buses are fairly non-essential. Things like drain mast heater, logo lights um, and what have you. But they are also covered by this galley switch. IFE buses, if you've got an aircraft uh, fitted with these, um, they're also fed from the from the transfer buses, used for airphone equipment and the passenger seat outlets. You'll know you've got these because you'll have the IFE passenger seat switch. This switch only does the IFE passenger seat buses. So it does exactly what it says on the tin. All right, the ground service bus next. The ground service buses are powered by either the transfer buses or from a ground power unit if available and selected. The switch on the forward attendant panel, uh, and you see I've shown you a switch there on the classic on the left and on the NG on the right, uh, they both control both relays by the way. Uh, I don't mean to mislead you with this graphic. Um, it, it was just a way of me showing the, the, the different ground service switch uh, on the classics and the NGs. So depending what type of aircraft you're on, flicking that switch will flick that relay and that will send the the power for the ground service buses to, to, to come directly from the ground power unit and bypass the transfer buses. So if, if you're on a turnaround, you, you probably wouldn't use this switch. You would just power the ground service buses from the transfer buses. If you're a, about to night stop, uh, putting the aircraft away for the night, then you would, you would hit the, the, the ground service bus switch. And that way they can, the, the, these um, the outlets, the, the cargo hold lights, the, the auxiliary and main battery chargers can be fed straight from the ground power unit. Right, this monster is uh, is one of a pair of power distribution units. All of the AC and DC power distribution and load shedding is controlled by two of these which live in the e e bay. This particular one contains the breakers for DC bus 1, AC transfer bus 1, main bus 1, ground service bus 1. GCB and BTB ones and the the APU power breaker. It might come as no surprise to learn that the other one is pretty much the same but for the number two buses. Standby power has got its own distribution unit on the P6 panel in the flight deck and I will cover that on the on the second video. So as we've spoken about load shedding from that um, from that power control unit let's look at how it works on on the schematic so this is the in-flight single generator case for aircraft with the cabin util and IFE passenger seat switches it is it is different if you've got the galley switch and I will cover that in a moment so you've you got a single generator load shedding will happen incrementally as needed in the following sequence. First of all the galleys and the main bus on transfer on, on transfer bus 2 will, will be dropped first. If it, the, the, the generator needs to, to load shed further then the galleys and main bus on transfer bus one will be th will be shared. If there needs to be further load shedding, 
then the IFE buses will be shed last. I must admit this came as a surprise to me when I read it that the that, that the IFE buses will be the last thing to go before things like the drain mast heaters on the main bus and uh, and and the the door area heaters but that's the logic Boeing have given it. If your aircraft has got a galley switch then the load shedding sequence is slightly different and it is as follows. First things to go are the galley buses on transfer bus 2, second to go are the galleys on transfer bus 1 and then the last thing to go are the main buses on transfer on, on main bus 1 and, and, and main bus 2 coming off transfer bus 1 and 2. Of course if you've got a, a galley switch only you don't have IFE buses so the, I've deleted those from this image. Now for load restoration it, it happens in the in the reverse sequence. So shed IFE buses will be the first thing to be uh, restored and they will actually come on automatically if a generator, be it either the engine or the APU generator, is restored. However, the galley buses and main buses, they if they don't restore automatically, then you are advised to to recycle the cabin util switch off and on, and that will, we're told, restore the electrics to those uh, to those buses. Load shedding on the ground when you're on the APU only is slightly different. Um, it's it's the same as the the in-flight single Jenny case. And again, manual restoration of the galley in the main bus can be attempted by cycling the, the galley or cabin util switch off and on. In flight, when you're on the if you're unlucky enough to be on the APU Jenny only, all of the, the the galleys and the main buses go together. Then the IFE buses. All right, flight deck panels. Um, as you know, we've got the uh, the metering panel, the generator drive and standby panel, and the generator bus panel. They're your three electric panels on the flight deck, running top to bottom. On the originals, the, uh, the, the the metering panel looked pretty similar to the classics, except it didn't have a position for the the inverter on the AC side, but it's it's pretty much identical to the the classics. Um, as far as I know, all originals were, were single battery. There were no two battery, uh, dual battery options on the originals. The test positions on these, uh, which, which are also there all the way through to the, uh, to the max, uh, they're used in conjunction with the power system test panel, which I will show you later in this presentation. And the max Jenny load on the originals was 111 amps. On the classics, um, slight uh, facelift for, for that. Uh, you see, we've now got an inverter position on the uh, on the AC side. The other point to note on this that this was a dual battery classic, um, and the the battery, the second battery, was was known as an APU battery. Okay, a word about the the residual bolt volt button, and um, this was uh, this was eliminated on the on the NG and the Max. Um, so this is used to test a generator that has that has come off a bus. Now, when pressed, the voltage a volt if a voltage is seen, then that means that the generator is still turning. Therefore, a generator showing zero residual volt has failed and will not reconnect. Residual volt is, uh, is the only selection to use the 30 amp um, scale on the AC voltmeter. And for this reason, the residual volt button should never be pressed when a generator is connected to a bus because it will try and show 115 volts on a 30 volt scale, uh, which could damage the meter. So. If your jennies are running and working and on online, 
don't press the residual volts button because you may damage the meter. The metering panel on the NG and the MAX uh, looks quite different. Um, the meters have gone um, to, or at least changed to digital displays. And you'll notice that there are five displays, not four as there were previously. And that's because the, the AC amps is now displayed here, uh, which has come from the, the GEM bus panel. Residual volts button, as I've said, that's been removed. We've now got three captions there. Uh, battery discharge, uh, one for failed TRUs, which I'll cover on the, on the DC, and electric caption. Uh, elec will only illuminate on the ground and it indicates a fault in the, the, the DC or standby power system. So again, I'll be covering that in, in, in that module. We got switches there, as as we know, for cabin util, knifey, passenger seat. They replaced the, the galley switch, although in actual fact some early NGs did have a galley switch. And I've given a list of the, of the services covered by those switches. All right, onto the, the Gen Drive panel. Um, actually, the, the, the full name for this is the Gen Drive and Standby Power panel, but I've, I've just sort of greyed out the Standby Power section because, again, I'll be covering that in the, in the second video. This is what it looks like on the, the originals and classics. Um, a higher than normal rise you know, we've got the, the rise and the in positions there on the, uh, or, or the rise and the, the in selector to, to look at the, the, the different temperatures. Uh, a higher than normal rise will indicate an excessive generator load or poor condition of the drive. Um, those temperature gauges are, are, are gone, so they're removed from the NG, uh, as, as also the, the, the rise and the in selector. Limitations for you, for those who still find originals and classics, the, the Max Jenny rise 20 degrees and the Max Jenny drive oil temperature 157. So, for the for the NG and the Max, I say the, the, the temperature gauge is gone, the rise and the in selector is gone. The also, the, the low pressure and high oil temperature captions have, have gone. They've been replaced by a single drive caption. And this will illuminate for either an IDG low oil pressure or an under frequency. A QRH procedure, in, in each case, of the, the, there's no distinction. If the drive light illuminates, the QRH directs you to manually disconnect the associated IDG. Red guarded switches for, for this because this is irreversible in flight. Once you've disconnected, physically disconnected an IDG, the only way to, to reconnect it is on the ground by pulling the T-handle that I showed you in the earlier photo. Interesting to note that a high oil temperature will not cause the fault light to illuminate because the IDGs will automatically disconnect for, for a high oil temperature. So there we go. The generator bus panels now, this one is the, the classics. Uh, we got an amber transfer bus off light. This comes on when the respective, as you'd expect, when the when the AC transfer bus does not have power. Don't forget that on the on the classics, the transfer bus is not the same as the transfer bus on the NG. The amber bus light, this is is that the respective AC Jenny bus is not energized. That's the one that we know is the transfer bus on the NG. So here is the NG panel. So the AC ammeter is now part of the metering panel. And where the, 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 the Gen bus off light was, we now got a source off light. And this indicates that the respective AC transfer bus is not energized by the source you last selected. The gen off bus, uh, the APU gen off bus, and the ground power available light, so that's the four blue lights, now all Ill illuminate when the respective generator is running and of the correct quality. 
that was always the case with the with the bottom three lights but the correct quality is is now different for the for the ground power available light all right idg disconnection and um i i just put this in for for interest that this was a an it happened to me scenario um so we, what we've got here the first thing you see is that the drive light is illuminated as a result of that uh i disconnected the uh i i threw the the manual disconnect switch as directed by the qrh and the gen off bus the blue gen off bus light is illuminated showing that the engine jenny number two is now off the bus the apu is running uh you can tell because the uh the egt gauge is uh is, is showing and the apu switch is on which is the obvious next step and it's online you can see from the metering panel i've got apu gen selected and it's showing 400 hertz 117 uh, volts and 45 amps so it's 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 online and it is supplying current we are in flight you can tell that because the the cabin altitude um, is up there at 8,000 feet and this was not taken in a simulator because you can see shadows on all of the switches and the the the, 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 the lighting from the FO side so that's a genuine uh, IDG disconnection in flight um, that probably had about I don't know three or four maybe in in 18 years of flying the 737 so you know fairly unusual that they are quite reliable drives these days all right the GCUs um, these are the generator control units and these are only uh, fitted on the the NG and the max I mentioned them earlier but we'll have a closer look at uh, at, at these lights so the fault lights we we've got uh, we've got GCU fault, uh, GCB, which is the breaker, or uh, APB, because th these units are identical um, for the the engine jennies and the APU jennies. In fact, if you look down at the bottom of the photos, you can see the left-hand one is actually the APU generator in this case, and the right-hand one is the engine one jenny. Um, you also got IDG faults, feeder faults distribution of bus faults and bus tie bar faults so the engineer can stick his head in the in ebay have a look at this and you know immediately get an idea of what what the fault might be those fault lights will illuminate on their own if a fault exists the gcu test button is there to test the the, the actual gcu itself um, so th this is for the GCU test. If it passes, you'll get the green light in the middle. The GCUs on the originals and the classics there on the P6 panel, I showed you that on an earlier photo. So they're, they're behind the FO um, and they don't have the, the diagnostic lights. They use the, uh, the generator diagnostics panel, which I will show you now. This is it. Um, so first thing to say, this is only on the originals and the classics. Um, any of you who've, who've sat on the jump seat will, will see this if you turn your head to the right. It's used as an indication of whether or not individual AC and DC buses are powered. And it also gives reasons in the form of malfunction lights as to why a generator uh, has tripped. So it's multifunctional. I mean, this is you have to remember this is 1960s technology um, all of this is now done by by checking um, and you know either interrogating the, uh, the the GCUs we saw earlier or um, or, or looking in the CDU for, for, for by tests so the, this is how things were done you know 50 years ago malfunction lights are on the on the top two rows um, and they will illuminate Ill immediately when a fault occurs on either an engine or an APU generator. Uh, the, the decode for these is shown in that table below. So you can see that here we, we've got 
faults on both Jenny 1 and Jenny 2. We've got feeder faults and manual trip. And that in actual fact was the case. That, that, that I took this photo after an air test where after a land what, what one of the um one of the, the the test schedule items was to was to manually disconnect the the uh the idgs so doing that we got the the, the manual trip that also actually brings on the feeder fault light as well if the fault's on either jenny one or two and you've got vscfs fitted you can confirm the fault by the light tests on the the vscfs should you wish to do so the bottom part of the of the diagnostic panel actually shows the the, the AC bus light. So so they these light to show which buses are powered. Um, now you don't want these distracting lights coming on in in flight. I mean the, that that would really annoy you on a night flight. So the these are normally covered. Now I've I've opened the cover as you can see in the photo the the the, the black thing coming down, um, just to show you the what 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 lies behind the, the this panel. The top row of that is the, the A phase and the bottom row is, is the C phase. B phase you check on the, the AC metering panel uh, on the overhead panel. Next to, the, to that you've got the power system test panel. Um, and this is used to check individual phases of a generator or a bus. To use it, first select test position on both the AC and DC metering panels. There's another little table here which you go into to, to find out you know, what, either what it is you're looking at or, or what you want to look at. Um, and you select the appropriate combination on these two switches, go into the table to find out what, what voltage and frequency you're looking at. So as an example, we got the switches uh, in the photo in the B2 position. So that tells us that with, with the with the, the metering panels in the test positions, what they will be showing are the uh, the number two GCU DC voltage and the number two main bus uh, B phase voltage and frequency. So I say it's 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 a whole lot easier with the with the NG and the Max where where you just go into the into the panel and and, and see what you want. Um, if the metering panel isn't good enough for your purposes and you, you need a more accurate uh, reading, then at the bottom of this, you, you've got a place to, to put a, a handheld meter to, to, to plug that in, your, your, your AVO meter, uh, and, and get an accurate reading of any of those parameters shown on the previous uh, test table. If you ever wish to have a play about with this, and, and I'd say unless you're an engineer, I, I really wouldn't recommend it, um, please leave the, the left hand switch in the B position. This connects all three generator ammeters to the B phase and that leaves this, this panel select relays relaxed. So it, 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 uh, it doesn't wear out the, uh, the, the, the relays. There you go, that's pretty much everything I can think of about uh, the 737 AC electrical system. Um, the next one to come will cover DC and standby and also circuit breakers. Usual message from me, if you enjoyed this video, if you found it useful, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks very much.